um, this uh, or this morning. Um, this song has been on my mind a lot lately, and and uh, I guess with all the things going on in the world, you know, as a child of God, you know, this ain't our home. So we always got something to look forward to, something a whole lot better than this place. So um, just remember that. Just keep looking up when it seems like it's all dark and bad because I get caught up in it sometimes and I start thinking, you know, I got a reward after this. This ain't, this ain't home. So we'll try this. <clears throat> Somewhere beyond the grave There is a land Where Jesus went to prepare By his own And for the saved by grace, there is a resting place, and in a few more days, it will be mine. Some call it heaven, I call it Some call it dreaming, let me dream on. Some call it paradise, somewhere beyond the skies. Some call it heaven, I call it said you can't go back home again and things will not ever be as good as they've been but I've got good news for you when heaven comes into view one glimpse and you know the best is yet to come. Some call it heaven, I call it home. Some call it Call it paradise Somewhere beyond the skies Some call it heaven I call it home Some call it paradise Amen. I'm glad I call it home too. Praise God. Amen. Love that song. Love the truth in that song. And I'm looking forward to going home. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bible, take your Bible and you'll find the text in Psalm chapter 107. Psalm 107 this morning. And we'll continue our journey through this Psalm of Thanksgiving. And I've enjoyed this study. I pray that you have. And we've been looking at Psalm 107 for the last three or four weeks. And, um, the psalmist begins this psalm with, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Amen. For his mercy endureth forever. Amen? Amen? He's good. He's good in his character. He's good in his compassion. He's consistently good. He praise God. 
He never changes. And so it's a call to praise and thanksgiving. And so this, this week we celebrate as a nation, right? We celebrate on Thursday. We don't, it's not just Turkey Day, though we're going to eat our share, right? Uh, but Thursday's a day of thanks. And can I say, as a child of God, every day ought to be a day of thanks. Not just one Thursday for the year, not just one day a week, but every day. If we're not going to hell, praise God, we ought to be thanking God and saying hallelujah uh, for his goodness and for his mercy towards us. And so uh, here's in this psalm, it's a call uh, to praise, to thanksgiving. And so I want to read verses 23 as, as where we'll start. Down through verse 32, the Bible said, They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger, like a drunken man, and are at their wits' end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. He bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them, be, let, him, uh, let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. With the help of the Lord, I want to preach on this thought this morning. I want to preach on this thought. Saved at sea from panic to paradise. From panic to paradise. Father, I pray that you'd help us in the next few moments as we look into your word. I pray that, Lord, you'd bless the reading of your word, your preaching of your word. I pray, God, you'd use me, just a vessel, but I pray, God, you'd fill me afresh and anew and use me to preach the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. We love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. So once again, we, are, we have the mandate here to praise God. We are to give thanks and to praise him. We are to praise him for his goodness, for his mercy, and he said in verse number 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. So if we're redeemed, if we've been saved, we've been delivered, we've been born again, we've been rescued, we ought to say so. We ought to say thank you, Jesus. We ought to say praise the Lord. We have seen different pictures in this psalm. We have seen how the psalmist used different uh, individuals and different type people to describe and to portray to us the truth of redemption and salvation. We started out in this chapter. He looked at wanderers, those that had no place. They were wandering, but they were turned to worshipers. And then he looked at prisoners turned into prisoners. And then last week we looked at uh, those who were sin sick, who had been healed, and they had turned into shouters. Praise God, I want to be a shouter. Amen. I want to be one who praises the Lord. And now, here we have the final picture, and the final picture that he uses in this psalm is those of uh, the, the mariners or seamen or sailors who were saved at sea and they were taking from panic to paradise. And so verse number 23 tells us that these that go down to the sea in ships. The picture here is mariners, uh, seamen who have encountered a storm at sea and they are in great danger of being shipwrecked and drowning. And so this reference to sailors or seamen uh, these men were men who went to sea because it was their business that they carried out on ships. This wasn't military men. This was uh, the common worker who carried out his business on the ships. But the psalmist shows us that the seamen had great advantage of seeing the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. In verse number 24, he refers to that. He said, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. I don't know how many of you have ever gone down to the coast or maybe you got on a boat and went out and you see the waves and you see how the ocean comes in and how it goes out and you see the waves and you see how it works and it's just so much power and so much awe. And, and, and we see there the might of God. We see the hand of God in that all. And you know, when we look around, we see uh, that the works here that he's referring to, it's referring to the storms and the waves of the sea. 
When we look around us and see such power and such uh, awe it, it brings to us, we, we, are, we are face to face with the realization that there is a God. There is a God. General revelation tells us, it reveals to us that there is a God. You know, general revelation shows us enough, uh, uh, shows enough to us for us to realize uh, that there is a God and we are responsible to him. Amen. Yeah, so when I look into the heaven, the Bible said the heavens declare the glory of God. Right? When I, listen, when we look at general revelation, God's power displayed throughout creation, without even having the word of God, the Bible said general revelations leaves us without excuse. In other words, we see that we have a need, that there's a God somewhere. We may not know who he is. We may not know how to get to him. But general revelation said, there is a God, and you need him. And in the previous sections, we have seen sin dealt with. We have seen how sin caused trouble and distresses. We have seen the references to sin and to iniquities and to rebellion and to transgressions that led to the distresses and, and troubles of men. But here, we're not told anything about sin. There's no reference to sin specifically. But we are shown that there is general revelation that shows man that there's a God and that they need salvation. But listen to me. General revelation cannot save you. You'll never be saved. Some people say, well, I'm going to go out and worship God in the trees and the lake. You'll never get saved worshiping God in the trees and the lake. The trees and the lake show you there is a God, but they don't bring you to God. Yeah, man. So though we have no reference to these men causing the storm by their own direct sin, they were in the storm nonetheless, and the storm displayed the power of God to the point that there is a responsibility. Now, you need to remember something before we go too much further in this message. You need to remember that some storms are a result of direct disobedience. We, we remember the story of Jonah and how Jonah ran from God. And when he ran from God, he got into a storm. In Acts chapter number 27, we have the apostle Paul on a ship that the ship, the ship was shipwrecked. And it was because the men that were with Paul, they did not obey God. They didn't listen to God's man. But then there are other storms uh, yet that are uh, encountered in complete obedience. Listen to me in complete obedience to God's will, and they teach us something about faith and how to grow our faith. I'm reminded of Luke chapter number 8, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter number uh, 14, how Jesus told his disciples to get into the ship and go the other side, and then they encountered the storm of their life. But these men in our text, these mariners, they were in great danger due to nothing other then doing the business that they were accustomed to do. They went down to the sea. Uh, they worked in the ships. They got down in the ships, and in their ships, doing their business, they saw the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Uh, this reminds me of this fact this morning. The Bible said in Romans chapter uh, number uh, 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You say, what are you saying, preacher? Here's the fact. The fact is that we are all sinners by nature that was passed down from Adam, our father. And because of that, we all face death. So you may be sitting here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm not a drunk, I'm not an adulterer, I've never been a, a, a fornicator, I've never done this. And you think, well, I'm all right. Well, here's the problem. The problem is you're a sinner by nature. And you're in the storm nonetheless. You've got a nature. Can I remind you that dogs bark because they're dogs? They got a nature of a dog, so he barks. He don't become a dog by barking. He barks because he is a dog. And sinners, listen, sinners don't become sinners because they sin. They sin because they're sinners. They've got a nature. And every last one of us were born with that nature inside of us, that old man. And it likes to sin and it will sin and it will make a choice to sin. And the Bible said that we all are sinners and we received that nature from Adam. And because of that, he said that death passed upon all men for that all are sin. So you may think you're a good old country boy or just a southern belle and you think I'm just a good old Christian person. And can I just remind you this morning that good old boys don't make it into heaven. 
Yeah, man. Good old country folk don't make it into heaven. The only kind of people that go to heaven, there's only one kind. They're the forgiving kind. Amen. And we, so we have this picture that's given to us of these, of these sailors in a storm that have lost all hope. And here they are at the complete mercy of God. And this is a great picture of mankind trying to save themselves from sin, trying to do all they can. But without God, they are hopeless. And these mariners, they are in danger. They are in desperation. They uh, find deliverance, though, when they cry out to the Lord for help and ask God for help in their trouble. I want you to notice a few things with me about uh, this being saved at sea uh, this morning. Think about, number one, consider with me their situation. They're in a situation of danger, of distress, of, of, of disorder, if you will. It's ca catastrophe. It is chaos. Uh, one thing we know, uh, that whatever the reason for the storm, God was the one that caused this storm, and he had his way in his storm. The Bible says in verse number 25, For he commanded, that's God, he commanded and raised it the stormy wind, which lifted the waves thereof. Uh, another uh, one of the prophets wrote and said that the Lord has his way in the whirlwind. And I remind you, it was God that was in control of the whole matter. You say, preacher, what was it about this storm? Number one, I thought about this. They were unsafe in this storm. They were unsafe. All right? He said in verse number 25, uh, he said, For he commanded and raised it the stormy wind and lifted up the waves thereof. Hey, listen, hey, here, here it is, the picture that these waves, uh, the wind is blowing, and the wind is, is blowing them up and standing them up, and it's like a tempest. It's a whirlwind that's come up. And he said it lifted up the waves. It's rising them up on high, exalting them. And to where it's not just a little ripple, but here we have heaping billows of water, and they are coming on these boats. It reminds you, these men who worked in boats, hey, it was their business to be in the boats, in these ships. And now they were seeing the storm, and they were unsafe. He said, listen, he said they, they mount up to the heaven. He's speaking of the waters. He said they mount up to the heaven, and they go down again to the depths. The picture here is of a ship that is caught in the storm, and the waves take the ship high upon the crest of the waves, and then it comes plummeting down uh, to the surface of the sea, and it's being engulfed by the waters being covered by the waves and the seamen there uh, can only hold on and they attempt to ride out the storm because there's nothing they can do this is one of the most powerful and one of the most dangerous descriptions and pictures of a storm that we can find anywhere he's talking about not just a little bump in, in of a wave but he's talking about uh, you'd have to call somebody and say honey this is the big one we ain't never seen one like this. They are in a very unsafe. Listen, they are facing death. Not only that, he said in verse 26, he shows us how they are not only unsafe, but they are undone. In verse 26, he said, they mount up to the heaven, go down again to the depths. Here's the idea. They're up and they're down, and they're being tossed to and fro. And he said, their soul is melted because of trouble. Their soul is melted because of trouble. The idea of melting is like it's dissolved, it's softened and dissipated and consumed. Here it is, they're so, typically, listen, typically sailors are pretty tough men. But this storm had broken them and melted them to the point that now they are undone. They, are, they realize that they are in grave danger of death. Undone. And then I see this, they're unstable. Verse 27 says they reel to and fro. To and fro, it's like a picture of one at a festival who's bouncing back and forth, celebrating. They can't sit still. They're, it's like they're going, they're giddy. Or, but, but the idea here is that they're reeling to and fro. It's not that they're happy about it. It's that they cannot be still. There is no peace. There is no rest. And he said they stagger like a drunken man. And that is to quiver or to totter. It's like uh, to wander back and forth as, as a drunken man, to tremble and be unstable like one who is intoxicated. We've all probably witnessed uh, uh, the, the, the sad occasion of someone who's intoxicated and they, they, they're, they're, they can't stand still. You know, the police gets them out and says, walk the straight line. But they can't walk the straight line because they're staggering. They are teetering back and forth. And the idea here is that this storm has these sailors in such a, uh, a situation that they are, uh, listen, they are being tossed to and fro and they can't get a good hold and they don't know what to do and so it leaves them unable. The Bible said in verse 27, notice this, 
The Bible said in verse 27, and they are at their wits end. Or at their wits end. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever been at your wits end. But the word wits has the idea of your wisdom or your skill. And end just simply means to come to the end of it. You'd be spent up. So simply put, these men had done all that they knew to do. They had come to the end of themselves. They had come to the end of all of their knowledge. They had come to the end of all their ability. Their navigational skills and their mariner experiences were no, of no value when this storm hit. They used all their wisdom. They used all their might, all their ability, all of their tools. But then they were exhausted, and it seemed as they were hopeless. They're at their wits' end. I've heard people, when they get into a... A, a, a position or a, something under pressure, and they're in a spot. And I've heard people use that phrase. Well, preacher, I don't know what to do. I'm at my wits end. It simply means I don't know what to do. I've tried everything. I've, I've turned this way, and I've turned that way, and I've asked this person, and I've done this, but I, I just don't know what to do. I'm at my wits end. And here's the picture. These people, they are at their wits end. Can I remind you that when you get to your wits end, it's when a man comes to the end of himself and then and only then that God can get his attention and that God can deliver him because it's at his wits end that he'll cry out to God. I remind you of the prodigal son and now that prodigal son, he left his father's house. He wished his father was dead. He took his, his, uh, his substance and he went off to a far country and he wasted his substance. But the Bible said in Luke 15, 17, and when he came to himself, he had to come to himself. That is, he came to the end of himself, and he realized where he was. And he said, I'll rise, and I'll go to my father's house. And I tell you, that's when business starts picking up. When you hit rock bottom, amen, God knows how to pick you up. And so we see a situation here. They are unable. And there are people, listen, there are scores, there are multitudes all around us that are in the storm of sin and they are trying religion and they are trying money and they are trying position and they are trying tradition and they're trying many things but at the end of the day they're at their wits end because they're in a storm that they know not how to remedy. They're in a storm. And then I see not only their situation but I see their summoning. Notice this, the Bible said then, verse 28, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. Then they cry to the Lord in their trouble. The word cry has the idea that they cry out. They make an outcry. They're clamoring. They're looking for help. It's repeated in verse 6, verse 13, and verse 19 uh, throughout this psalm, and, and throughout these pictures of, of redemption, that it's when they're in trouble. Hey, when they hit rock bottom, it's then that they cry out. I see a summons of, of desperation. They're in trouble. The Bible said they cry in their trouble. The bad news is many times it takes trouble to get men to cry out to God. But the good news is when they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, he'll listen to their cry, he'll hear their cry, and he'll answer their cry. And so it's a cry of desperation, but it's also a cry of dependence. A cry of dependence. Watch this. The Bible said, and then they cry unto the Lord. Now I've said this before and I'll say it again. There's many ways into trouble, but there's only one way out. Yeah, man. Who are you going to call when you're in trouble? Who are you going to call when you're at your wit's end? You can't call the Ghostbusters. Hey, man, who are you going to call? There's only one to call. There's only one worthy to call. There's only one I know to call. Thank God, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be S-A-V-E-D saved. Yeah, man, it's a cry of desperation. It's a cry of dependence. And then I see their salvation because their cry leads to their deliverance. He said, and he, watch this, and he bringeth them. This is when they cry to the Lord in their trouble. And he bringeth them out of their distresses. Once again, that word distresses has the idea of troubles or straits, their anguish. So here, their cry led to their salvation. And it wasn't the cry that saved them. It's the one they cried to that saved them. A lot of people get hung up on what did I say. It doesn't really matter what you said. Here's what Peter said as he's singing, Lord, save me. Another place, have mercy on me, O oh Lord, a sinner. 
It's not, it's not in a sinner's prayer. It's not in a, a, a calculated set of words. It's in a heart condition and a, and a desperate cry, looking unto God and depending upon Him. It's with that, with the, with that with our mouth uh, you're making confession, and with your heart you're believing on Him. It's a cry, but it leads to salvation. Deliverance. Watch this deliverance to salvation involved pardon. Notice this. He said, I love this. And he bringeth them, them, them out of their distresses. That is, those who cried for help when they were in trouble, they were delivered. Y'all, y'all, man, I got to preach this for a second. There's a lot of people that thinks that the only people that God helps is the people that's got it all together. The people that comes in church with a suit on, the people that comes in looking like the preacher. Hey, look up in here. It ain't about what you wore when you come in here. Yeah, man. It ain't about how you look and how you smell and how you're acting. It's about your heart. God knows how to take wicked, dirty sinners and turn them into children of God. He can wash, he, listen, he can take a black heart, wash it in red blood, and bring it up white and snow. And it's those who are in trouble, and you'll never get help until you realize you're in trouble, and you'll never get help until you cry unto God, and you can't save yourself, and the church can't save you, and the preacher can't save you, and mom and daddy can't save you, and your good works ain't going to save you, and your money ain't going to save you. The only thing going to save you is the shed blood of the darling son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Say when it's applied to your account, because by faith and in repentance you trusted him. Then, watch this, then they cried unto the Lord and in their trouble, and he bringeth them, those who were in trouble, they were sinking deep in sin, but thank God, love lifted me, hallelujah. It's their pardon, he delivered them. Don't get too excited about it, but he didn't stop there. In verse number 29, he said, he maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. So their salvation included pardon, Brother Wayne, but it also included peace. Oh, yeah, the peace. He calmed the storm. He calmed the waves. He maketh the storm a calm. That word calm is like a a whisper or a steal in the New Testament. Remember, he said, peace be still. He maketh the storm a calm. So here we we had a storm where the waves were up over the boat and down and, and in the boat and rocking the boat. and People that were accustomed to sailing on ships, they were to and fro. And now he calms the storm. And watch this. He said, so that the waves, they're over steel. So even the waves now are inactive. They are holding their peace. The waves are kept quiet. I don't know about y'all. I've been on the ocean when it was kind of rough. I told y'all about the time I went, we went out to deep sea fishing. I didn't do much fishing. I did a lot of sleeping. But we got on the boat. It was dark that morning, 4 o'clock or so. We, we headed out. And it was so rough out there, Brother Wayne. I was in the cabin, and there was a bench on each side, inside. And I was laying on that bench, and there was a big cooler I had that cooler, Brother Jake, pulled up beside me so I didn't roll off. And when I woke up, I was on the floor on the other side of the cooler. It's pretty rough. I mean, you take 200 pounds and throw it. I don't know, but I have never seen a storm that was that rough instantly smooth. Usually there's a, when the storms hit, Usually there's a couple days after a major storm hits that it just takes a couple days for everything to smooth back out. But now he said that he calmed the storm. Y'all see that? That the waves thereof are still. I'm simply saying this to you. God can not only forgive you and pardon you, but he can say peace be still to the storms in your life. The church can't do that. Your mama can't do that. Your papa and mama can't do that. But there's a God in heaven that can bring peace to you. He can give you a peace that passeth all understanding. You can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this, not only that, but our salvation includes pleasure. 
I told you last week, you ought to be saved and happy about it. Notice this. I love this. He said in verse number 30, Then are they glad because they be quiet. I don't know about y'all. I've heard a lot of people get saved and they cry, right? I don't know about y'all might have cried tonight. But the night I got saved, this is the honest truth. The night I got saved, I went home and I remember walking in. I'm sort of a bashful person by nature. And I walked in and I couldn't quit smiling. To the point that my mom looked at me and said, what's wrong with you? And I said, hey, I got saved. There was a burden that was just taken off of me. There was chains that broke and fall. I was free, amen. I had been delivered. I had been redeemed. I had been ransomed. I had been rescued. I had been regenerated. I was born again. Happy. I tell you, this morning, saved people ought to be the most happy people that exist. He said this, then they were glad. Then are they glad. Y'all see that? Y'all see that, right? I'm in verse number 30. Then are they glad because they be quiet. I don't know about y'all, but I was glad when the peace came into my life. I was glad, Brother Jake, when I could lay down my head at at night and I could go to sleep and not have to worry about what was going to happen. Then are they glad because they be quiet. The word glad means to rejoice. It simply has the idea to be brightened up, to be cheerful, to, to make one joyful or merry. We sing that old song, happy am I, Jesus is mine forever, never to leave. Oh, hey, I'm glad. Hey, happy am I, I've been forgiven. My sins are gone, gone, gone. What sins are you talking about? Hallelujah. He said, I don't remember them anymore. I don't want to make you happy. You say, preacher, you're one of them happy babies. Call me what you want to be, but I'd rather be happy and glad. Hey, then, then, then sad. I didn't come to a morgue this morning. I didn't come to a funeral. A lot of people go in church. Y'all heard about the people, the rescue squad got called to a Baptist church, didn't you? Man, they had a heart attack, and they called a rescue squad, called 911. They come in and took three men out before they figured out which one died. I'm saying save people ought to be happy people. We ought to be able to sing old victory in Jesus like there's victory in Jesus. We ought to be able to sing, I'm saved, and I know that I am, praise God. Simply saying they were glad there's pleasure. Hey, I'll just say this to you today. I, I've known people, preacher, I'd get saved, but I wouldn't maybe I'd have no fun. I got I, listen to me. I heard that lie all my life. Listen, since I've been saved, I have more fun on accident than I did before I got saved on purpose. Are you listening to me? There's joy in knowing Jesus. Notice this the salvation includes pardon, it includes peace, it includes pleasure. And I like this, it includes paradise. Notice, notice here, here they are. They're, they're going down. Remember, they are, they are undone. They didn't know what to do. They were unable. So he bring. I'm in verse 30, the last part of verse 30. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. He bringeth them unto their desire. The word desire has, has an idea of a place of pleasure, a place of delight, a place that is pleasant. A valuable thing. And the word heaven simply has the idea of a city or it is a harbor that is shut in by the shore. That reminds you, I was in a storm one night going down for the last time when I cried out on the Lord for help. And he heard my cry. He delivered me. He forgave me. He gave me peace. He gave me pardon. But he said, I got a place for you. And I was in peril, I was in panic, but he heard my cry, he delivered me, and now I'm headed to God's paradise. Listen, my desired haven is heaven, amen. I used to be headed for a place called hell, but now, thanks be to God for his goodness and his mercy, I'm heaven bound with the hammer down. I've gone from panic and I'm heading for paradise, all because I've been pardoned by the good grace of God. Headed for heaven, amen. I'm looking forward to it. Sang about it a minute ago. I'm looking for home. Amen. Number four, I see their song. Verse 31 and 32. Here we have this refrain for the final time. 
in this chapter. As the psalmist looks back and reflects upon what the Lord has done and what he is, he says to those that have been saved, he's saying that you should have a song to sing. There's a reason to rejoice. We ought to have praise on our lips. Notice the motive for our song. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Here it is. For his goodness. That's his character. That's what he is. And for his wonderful works. That's what he does. That's his acts. To the, to the children of men. Let me ask you a question. Has God been good to you? Has God been good to you? I'm not asking you, is God good? That's a dumb question. God's good. But is God, has he been good to you? Oh, yeah, he's been good to you. If you're not in hell frying like bacon right now, God's been good to you. If you're lost this morning and need to be saved, God's been good to you. He's brought you in here in mercy and let you hear the gospel so that you have an opportunity to be saved. God's been good to you. He's been way better to me than I deserve. Our motive is, listen, is for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. I, listen, I owe him everything. I ought to say thank you. I ought to praise the Lord. Then I see they're magnifying in their song. Let them exalt him also. The word exalt means to lift up or to raise up on high. When, when we sing this song, when we praise him, our goal was not to say, look what I did. It's not about me. It's not about me and mine. It's about him. It's not what I did. I didn't turn over a new leaf. He saved me. I didn't do anything. I was going to hell. I deserve it. I was a sinner. I was lost. I was going the wrong way. I was blind. I was dead in sin. But God, who was rich in mercy, where with his great love he loved us. Hey, he saved us, praise God, by his grace. Are y'all listening to me? It's, if there's anything good about me, it's him and what he's done. And when we stand and when we testify and when we sing about the good grace of God or his character and the goodness of God and his, and his works toward the children of men and when we say things like, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works, not for our goodness and our works. It's not about us. It's all about him. Our song ought to magnify the Lord Jesus, not our problems. You go to a lot of churches and you hear the testimonies. And it's not testimonies, it's testimonies. Well, I was bad, and I was dead, and I, 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 I don't know, I, 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 I. and it, man, you're depressed listening to them. Just tell us how good God's been. What has God done for you? A, a, simply a testimony ought to be, look what God's done for me. I see the multitude in their song. Watch this. Because he's worthy. Can I say our God's worthy, not just secretly, but he's, he's worthy, not just privately, but he's worthy publicly. Publicly. Everybody needs to know. Watch, here's what he said. He said, let them exalt him also in the congregation, in the congregation, in the congregation of the people. Well, preacher, I praise the Lord in my car. Wonderful. Preacher, I'm going, I'm going to make much of Jesus out in the field. Wonderful. But every once in a while, you, got, you ought to get a case that it can't help but it's in the church. In the congregation. The congregation has the idea of the company. It's the, it's the multitude, the convocation, the assembly. See what you're saying, preacher? Hear what I'm saying? I'm saying the preacher ought not have to beg you, plead with you, prime you, pump you up. If you're saved, you ought to have a testimony. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. The multitude. Hey, watch this. The word praise has the idea of to boast or make a boast. It's once again, it's making much. It's lifting him up. In the assembly. The assembly speaks of the ab abiding place, the place that's inhabited or a sojourning or the dwelling place. So whether it's at the meeting place, at church, or at your home place, or wherever you are, we who are saved, we who are redeemed, we should be boasting of, we should be praising God, we should be lifting Him up on high for others to see and others to hear. Listen, on this ship, in the storm, no one else but God and the sailors saw what God had done for them. It was up to them to come back to shore and say, Hey, I was sinking deep in sin. 
But thank God he came by. And in love and mercy he lifted me. Now they had been saved at sea. They had been rescued. They had been delivered. They should be praising him and exalting him and making much of him so that others may know what God could do for them. So this morning, here's the message. Don't, don't miss this. When you lose all hope, you're not hopeless. When you think you're going down for the last time, one cry could change your life. As long as there's a God, there's hope. As long as Jesus lives, there's hope. If you'll trust Jesus today, if you'll realize you're in trouble, realize that you're sinking in sin, realize you're going down, if you'll trust Him and cry out to Him today, you can be saved at sea today. There's a song in our hymn book. It's called The Haven of Rest. It goes something like this. It says, My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distressed, till I heard a sweet voice saying, Make me your choice. And I entered the haven of rest. I yielded myself to his tender embrace and faith taking hold of the word. My fetters fell off and I anchored my soul. The haven of rest is my Lord. The song of my soul since the Lord made me whole. He has been the old story so blessed. Of Jesus who will save whosoever will have a home in the haven of rest. How precious the thought that we all may recline like John the beloved and blessed on Jesus' strong arm where no tempest can harm, secure in the haven of rest. Oh, come to the Savior. He patiently waits to save by his power divine. Come, anchor your soul in the haven of rest and say, my beloved is mine. The chorus said, I have anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep, but in Jesus I'm safe evermore. Have you been saved at sea? If so, you've gone from panic to paradise. And you ought to thank God. You ought to praise Him. you got a song to sing. I've been redeemed. Let's stand all across the auditorium. Father, I pray you take the message today. Speak to hearts and lives and help us. Lord, I don't know who's here. I don't know the hearts of each man, woman, boy, and girl. But I trust you know how to take the word of God. Spirit of God, use God. Speak to their hearts. Convict that heart of stone. Melt it. Bring them to the point where they'll cry and they'll be saved. Save souls that need to be saved. Encourage Christians. Maybe remind us, Lord, what you've done for us. Remind you where, remind us where you brought us from, and what you did for us. And we thank you today. We want to give you all the praise for salvation, full and free in Jesus Christ. Help us today. Have your will and way. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. There's several at the altar already. There's people at the altar. If you're here today, you need to be saved. Somebody like to take a Bible. <coughs> God knows your heart. There's several at the altar this morning. You need to come. You mind the Lord. If you need to be saved, God will save you today. If you are saved, maybe you just want to thank Him. Maybe you just want to give Him praise. Let Him know you're glad. Because they'd be quiet. Thank God for the peace that He brings in our life. I bless his name.